Greetings to you Patriots. I'm so glad that you are joining us here tonight. I hope you had a chance to enjoy the full worm moon. It's uh, simply gorgeous and there's still, you know, of course there's plenty of leftover, but uh, I saw it was really huge last night and we went to this sort of marshy area near our house because the frogs were out in full regalia on the full moon and I was able to bring some of my equipment down and you are listening to the sounds of the beautiful frogs showing off in their bass, tenor, and soprano ribbits for us. As well, I have included some pictures that I took of the full moon in the area I was at, so enjoy those. The name of our piece tonight is Obsolescence, Division, and Fight. There are so many things that have occurred this week, and as the energetics have been uh, suggestive and, and, and high around a lot of um, emotions running really strong, things getting worked out, things being started, uh, and uh, people, I think, are waking up, it seems to me, in the way of, I think, that we'll see more of as we move into these waves and nuances of Second Renaissance. What's also interesting, I haven't really had a chance to look too much into a couple of things I've heard, but I've had a couple of people let me know that they've seen some extraterrestrial activity in the sky and I myself encountered a few things this week that were very indicative that the energies that are moving around and the ways in which our electrical grid perhaps uh, that we call electricity but the energetic that is behind electricity I think is I wouldn't say working incongruently with itself but I would say there's quite a bit of surge and so it seems as though that with the ley lines and the earth itself registering some of this electrical current and these energies that are intermingling predominantly that we really do seem to be moving into perhaps some uncharted waters and at the very least the experience that is coming from having a whole new way of being in a life that we are now at the brink of. We've talked about this before, but really having a moment where we expect things to return to what they were before, um, some of the ways in which we've been upset about what the new normal is, and can't we just go back to having things that were normal? Things were really never normal. There are things that we've gravitated towards, and there are also ways in which we have become accustomed to in our growing up, attached to certain ways. It doesn't mean that those things were necessarily wrong or that we shouldn't have become attached to certain things. But as we are moving into a whole new time, it's really important to remember that these are the things we've asked for. These are the things we have been praying about, we've been talking about, and we are now at that place where things are starting to shift. There are things that are falling away and there are ways in which things are emerging that perhaps we would have never suspected that they would. I think I've had more conversation this week in one concentrated week than I've ever had in any week of my life. And I'm so grateful for it. The people I've been talking to, the ways in which we've been interchanging and the ways in which we perhaps would have considered the parallels to be coincidences are now very evident that they are not. Things are moving in tandem. There is an order to everything. And when we pay attention to what is actually so, rather than what we want to see as so, or what we want to not see that is so, then what we have is an actual snapshot of even what we have considered to be just beginning now, but really has been occurring for quite some time, and we are now available to receive it, perceive it, and recognize it. I was having a conversation with my sister, and she had talked about the word obsolete, simply because we were uh, discussing the ways in which there are markers, there are pieces of information and points of reference that we think are very, very important for humanity. And we got into the topic of how that could be in the next generation or so, maybe even sooner, that some of these points of reference will all but disappear. 
Now, I'm not saying that I want things to return to the way they were before. I don't. But what I will say is that the ways in which we have related as humans, the ways in which we have created some of the infrastructures of our societies, and in the sense of that which is natural and normal, it is imperative that we know what these resources of the source, which is God, have carried us through and brought us to where we are to some degree. We have been provided with so many ways in which our humanity has thrived. And our Heavenly Father does know exactly what it is that we must preserve and keep. And while we are given this free will to do with as we see fit and as we desire, what is becoming very clear to me is that it's not that we return to our nature, but that we actually unobstruct it and understand that our nature will always truly reflect the perfect design of God. And anything that we make out of that that is incongruent with that design is still simply part of that design as well. And as we direct the human through the Spirit and the Holy Spirit of God that we have been provided with, it is important for us to remember during these times that we may be witness to things falling away that simply were never part of our nature to begin with, and that those parts of our nature that seem to be augmented are simply being released from the bondage of their obstruction. I was having a conversation recently about the desire and the drive towards the individual expression of each human being. And we began discussing the concept of Newspeak from 1984, George Orwell. If you're not familiar with that, this is a part of the story of 1984 in the dystopic pictorial of the future. There is something called Newspeak wherein words are actually taken out of the dictionary and people then do not have those words to express what it is that they are feeling. So for a moment, if you just imagine that the word anger was taken out of the dictionary, and you never knew the word anger, and yet you were angry. If someone were to ask you, what is it that you're feeling? Really, all you could come up with is, it's a strong emotion. It's, it's just this big thing that I'm feeling. It's a big emotion. And in essence, that kind of hobbling, that kind of injury to the vocabulary that one would normally use, creates this entire scenario wherein if you cannot express, if you cannot communicate what it is that you're actually feeling, that doesn't mean you're not feeling it. And that doesn't mean it's not gonna well up inside of you. And perhaps instead of being expressed, it becomes the outplay and acting out born of the pressure that is difficult to release in a constructive way because you have nothing to call it. And so in essence, some of these reference points, whether they are words, or things that we remember as even buildings that we used to see. And I would say the ways in which those buildings were filled with social activities and interaction. What we find is that the hunger for expression in humanity never goes away. It never becomes obsolete. But the control that has been exercised and the conditioning over humanity has been to such a degree that we are now facing generations that do not remember having those words, having those constructs, and having those social skills that answered the call of the desire, the curiosity, and the inherent design for us to express individually and together. This leads to division. And as most of you know, I have begun a second branch of the confessional close-up called Lesbian Training for Men. And the tip I will be putting out next is about communication. Because once you start taking away that which was never meant for any of us, the, the code of shame, as in the song, The Gift by Annie Lennox off of her Diva album, take this over code of shame, it never did belong to me. Once we start removing these things that we had mistakenly thought were part of us, but were only designed to control our expression and the ways in which we live our lives because of those expressions, we start to uncover that which is the basic design and desire of all people, be that we are cognitively aware of that or not. 
In another part of the discussion I had this week, there was some pointing out that perhaps some have had the opportunity to be exposed to some amount of diversity and the education that comes from knowing there are others that express differently and have different motivations and thus perhaps completely different philosophies and perhaps completely different ways of conducting life than we do. And what came to me was that whether one has been presented with this opportunity in an obvious fashion or not, that once it's discovered that perhaps our disregard or ignorance about the difference in cultures, thought patterns, and expression, that once we become aware of those things and perhaps see moments of not quite being so constructive within our interactions, then that is the moment to investigate how not to modify the human being through technology or otherwise, but how to modify our behavior. There has been, I think, quite a bit of misdirected and judgmental energy aimed at and targeted to people who have certain thoughts and ideas that are not congruent with the rest of the people around them. And this is as old as dirt. And yet what we know is that while one might have taken the chance of being thrown out of the tribe, perhaps in a nomadic population because of the threat of difference, that really the only time this becomes a toxic division is when we expect uniformity to the degree that we insist on the stagnancy of humanity rather than the accommodation for the introduction of new ideas, philosophies, and perhaps an improved experience of our state of being. And so what I'm bringing across tonight is that indeed there is a difference between difference and division. And while it has been sold to us again and again and again, ironically, through the lens and through the mouthpiece of supposed diversity, we must be very aware that identifying diversity can only truly help us out if indeed it is not an effort to achieve some agenda of uniformity at all cost. The other thing that has become even more clear to me in the last week and a half or so is what is my fight and what is God's fight? What is ours to fight and what is God's to fight? As we have covered some of the concepts around what is bravado and what is bravery, my life has been tested in these last days to really see what that actually means to me and how much of it I'm vested in. And what I can say to you is that I'm very, very clear about what I can do as a directed by spirit human and how well I can identify for myself what is not mine to take on. And this isn't because I have this big idea about what it is that I'm picking and choosing to take on or not. It is simply an understanding of the spiritual laws and the laws of nature and the laws of God, which are all the laws of God, that which could be very deconstructive to myself and that which I would do best to adhere to, as I do not control it, I did not create it, and I am subject to it as any other human. There are so many right now that are very caught up in the minutia, simultaneous with outcrying of when are things going to happen? When is this going to happen? When are we going to see the arrests? When are we going to see this? When are we going to see that? And I've heard people say that, well, all we can do is wait. Well, there is no waiting. There's no waiting. We really are in this time of knowing what it is that we must fight for, what it is that we must build together, how it is that we are to be in construction during this time that we claim is a waiting period. There is no waiting unless you consider God will just take care of every single little detail and that here we are with nothing to do. This is not the case. For just as God made the flood, Noah was busy building the ark and taking instruction. And I find that the lens that we all have, that we've lived through, that we know well, is that arena that we can do so much in. And I would also say that if it's not clear what there is to do, that is the first task, finding out what there is to do, because there's plenty. When I think of the people that have sacrificed much, much more than I have, so that I can be where I'm at 
and indeed where all of us are. And when I think of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his blood for us, that there is no waiting. The starting line has been crossed. The gun has gone off. And if we are waiting to develop ourselves to simply get in the race, this is yet another part of the conditioning that we have been sold, that we cannot possibly be responsible for any part of what we are about to do, for how we are next to run this race, because we need to wait until we develop into something better. There is nothing better. There is only what we are, and there is only who we are, and there is only doing that which is there to do right now, in this moment. Because whether things stand or whether they fall away, what we know is that God is not obsolete and our design is not obsolete. And we must not allow this divisiveness, this division to seep in so far that it not only divides each of us from each other, but it divides ourselves from ourselves. And there is no doubt that as we go to fight, we will be shown what there is to fight for and how we are to do it. And we will also be shown where not to do the fighting, that which we cannot possibly wage war on because it is not ours to do, it is God's. In these ways, we become the faithful people. We develop the skill of faith and the funded faith that we build each time we turn to God and know that our place isn't taken, that our place in this grand scheme of the spiritual war that we are in and the ways in which we will move into the second renaissance isn't some far away parking spot or port. It is a place that we were actually placed in so long ago and that we have been invited to come from to fight for, create, and advance all of humanity into the second renaissance wherein we are as unified as we are diverse.